lot of things have changed. I have seen the change in students, the profile, the nature of the, the symptoms have changed. So we thought it's very important that the students understand the nature of mental illness is changing over a period of time. Uh, and also understand that some issues which are uh, uh, which appear to be very ordinary, simple, like consumption of uh, cannabis, which seems to be taken uh, quite lightly by some students, is, is can be a very serious problem, uh, and they can it, it, they, they can land up in a very serious problem. So we thought it's best that we address these uh, facts and these issues head on. So we thought of uh, having uh, Dr. Sanjay Kumawat as uh, to address us, and we'll also supplement. Dr. Sanjay Kumar brings to the table a, 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 a long experience of working in a in Thane Medical Hospital. Also as a private psychiatrist, he has been past president of the local body, Bombay Psychiatric Society, and uh, he has uh, experience as a director of medical education also. So an administrator as a clinician, as a clinician, uh, experience is very vast, and uh, I'm glad that number of students have come. I would like to check how many student representatives are here. Student representatives. Yeah. Yeah. Four of you, five. Okay. And rest of you are hostel wardens. How many of hostel wardens? Yeah. Okay. And rest of the crowd is? All managers. Yeah. All managers. All managers. All managers of hostel. All managers. Yeah. Right. So students who are, the people who are very close to students. Simple. Right? So that's the best way and we have also Dr. Tongar here. Yeah. I'm a faculty. Okay, yeah, great. Yes, Thank so you. So I'm also close to students. Thank you, yeah. So people very, very close to students uh, are here. So I'm glad uh, that you have come here to spend some time of your morning. Uh, I would like to ask by, uh, now the session is yours. We will have very little role to play. We would like all of you to ask questions to Dr. Kumar regarding all the problems that you think mental health issues are currently that you're, you face, in the sense you face with your colleagues, your friends and you think that some intervention is required, where, what, how and how early intervention can be can go a long way in prevention of a of major breakdown. That's the whole idea of uh, uh, the equation. Uh, so I would like you to ask as many questions, just ask a very simple question and initiate a dialogue with Dr. Kumar. The question that, where is that you require a mental health intervention, you know? How do you decide that this person requires a mental health treatment or does not require mental health treatment? This is very relevant because most of them walk in and say that I don't need it, I can control myself, it's all within me. And how can you help me as an outside point? So this is a common thing that most students face. So we would like you to say something. Very interesting question. Uh, one of my colleagues has written a book in Marathi on mental health. Uh, a couple of family friends, the entire family rare group, non medicals of course, and they all reported, boss, look who come to me like that, how many patients are We could identify so many symptoms of those patients because he has given nice stories about uh, various his past patients. Yeah, yes, but then uh, talking about then when to call yourself mentally disturbed or suffering. Generally, mental health has three domains the mood, the thinking or the thoughts, and the behavior. With these three main domains, we work with various dimensions of life our personal life, our academic life our professional life, our family life, our social life. Now, if on these three pillars, suppose you find disturbance in either of these three, uh, either of these various dimensions, or with all of them, failing in social bonding, failing in family relationship, failing in your professional excellence, failing in your academic excellence, interpersonal adjustments. <coughs> yes, you must take a call that you need some kind of mental health. Because you are failing and that it has gone out of your control. 
so that is the time that you must take help of a mental health professional may not be a psychiatrist may be a counselor may be a psychologist etc but you must consult that is your first uh, sensitization with these people where they will able to judge my zero or serious that is how when you should initiate some kind of uh, contact with a mental health professional yeah what questions sir yeah okay yeah So that's where you, you know, the, the bell should ring and it should be able to take the call. So I think that's that's another thing. Uh, some more questions about early detection? Feel free to ask. Ma'am, you would like to say something? Yeah, I, you see, I would like to know how to handle a student who is facing such problem and how to identify if student comes regularly, okay. sits in the lab and moderately working okay. but still suffering i have been i have faced earlier how to identify that the student is uh, suffering inside and not able to speak out or can uh, outsider uh, see that uh, some way or the other you know so i think i have to see you can respond okay. see it is very easy also and it is very difficult to watch when the degree is too much we can smell if i am sitting in a consulting room and i outside hear lot of noise i know some violent patient has come out but sometimes the patient who is sitting in front of you is like a silent volcano you don't know what is going on in his world he is not connected with the surrounding he is in his own world so the range is right too much connectivity in form of hallucinations or to zero connectivity and connectivity within to the own thoughts and imaginations and then you find that suppose from his appearance from his mood from his uh, flow of speech from his likings dislikings you talk for a minute a couple of minutes and from the flow of his thoughts what kind of thoughts he is bearing whether optimism is there whether pessimism is there where there is a hostility where there is a anger where there is some kind of uh, insecure feeling where there is a some kind of uh, 
worthless or hopeless feeling. You also see how he is judging the situations. There are simple situations, there are certain complicated situations and how he is judging them. Whether he is attending to what you are talking or when others are uh, uh, attending particular activity, whether he is at that present, at that time particularly present in that particular situation. All these things make you understand there is something wrong with him. In that case, you may ask him further questions about how do you feel. He may come out, he may withdraw. Self-reporting may be very poor in, in, in when you are mentally not in a, in a good frame of mind. Because there are two things that are happening. One is they are rationalizing. Sometimes it is too good also. Yeah. Right. So the, I'm, I'm, I'm in a very, very good condition. So it's, their rationalization is also very high. That means I, I know why I am doing it. Most of the students walk in and say, I know what is wrong with me. So that, that is also uh, one thing that they, they do. Rationalization and intellectualization. So they also come and say that I have read it on the Google and I know these symptoms come and this is my diagnosis. You know, so a lot of students have this idea of being able to understand themselves, know what is going wrong. Knowing what is going wrong is never enough. You know, it doesn't cure any, any problem. Knowing that I have diabetes it doesn't bring down my sugar, as simple as that. Secondly, I think the approach that uh, I will just start talking about Dr. Tagare also is that uh, Two things that, that I, I believe miss from the communication that happens between the student and the caregiver, it could be a, a teacher, it could be a mentor, a student guide or anyone, is uh, they, they have walk in and they feel that I talk with him or I talk with her but I never had this feeling that the person understood me. So making statements that we want to understand you and we understand you that there is a situation you are going, you seem to be very upset about things and we understand and we are here to help you to know what is going wrong with you. 
So I think that that statement that I understand you becomes very very crucial. And this is perhaps that the person is in need of hearing that somebody says I understand you, and it is a situation which is a human situation. And spending a little more time, I think, this becomes a long way. Thirdly, I think what happens is being more in authority, we tend to become get into immediate preaching mode. You know, you shouldn't be like this. You don't do, don't do it this way. You know how time flies. You know, you are here only for four years now. The exam is just coming. So we immediately get into a very preaching, a very sermonizing mode, and they nobody likes. We don't like. I don't like. Nobody likes sermonizing. So they don't like that feeling. And when that sermon starts, they simply shut off. So rather than sermonizing and preaching mode, just listening to them and say yes. We understand there is a problem. I think that would that would go a long way. So, a bit of uh, patience on our side, uh, patient listening becomes goes a long way. Person may not disclose what is the stand as far as the mental health law 
Uh, see, there are certain issues which is an issue directly related with the right of confidentiality of a person with mental illness or for any human being. Now, person with mental illness, if his illness is of such a nature that it can lead to any kind of social threatening situation, in that case, either the treating authority must inform it to the concerned person or the caregiver must inform to the authority. Now, depression and other elements. If this information is concealed from the recruiting authorities, then from social and his personal threat point of view, it is not good. This doesn't create a breach of confidentiality and right of confidentiality of that particular person. And I suppose this column is deliberately put with a proper understanding that why they want this column. There are issues in many of the mental illnesses as a symptom, impulsivity, low frustration rates, aggression, these are easy to occur with many mental elements. So from this point of view, understanding and having knowledge that the person across has mental ill health is mandatory as a part of the recruitment process. I don't think it's adverse. Yes, uh, I give some information, five years back, uh, the JE form says that if you have mental illness or epilepsy, you cannot get admission to IITs. We have moved that uh, yeah, uh, idea yeah. that uh, uh, whether you have mental illness or epilepsy, uh, you get admission to IIT. It is not uh, uh, like uh, they cannot... Stigmatizing or prohibiting thing for you. There is no discretion against... Uh, uh, the paper is passed through our BOG and I think all other IITs BOGs also that there is no such restriction. So it uh, should be voluntary. No one can be taken out of the institute on that, uh, 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 with that diseases and uh, they get it. Because if they have the knowledge as a part of administrator or the part of, uh, you know, kind of uh, guardian at that, then it will help you definitely in case of crisis. They will not be wise. They know that there was a history, so this has happened. So nothing to worry about, we can handle it. Sometimes the illness's nature is such that we don't know whether it is brain related right. mental illness or it is pure functional mental illness. There are only some places, mines or some things where uh, the declaration may uh, not allow you to join that field. That is for the protection of the person. Air force and things like this. Yeah, particularly epileptic seizures also we have seen. The students may be taking anti seizuring anti seizure drug for a long time, which never disclosed. They come here, they stop because the, you know hours are irregular, and suddenly they have a seizure, and nobody knows what what's going wrong with the with the student. And there is no mention that he is suffering from seizures, and that he has stopped treatment. Well, I have many clients who are working in a hostel kind of, I mean, studying in a hostel kind of setup, and uh, in fact the. Parents have gone to the level of informing his room partner to please see to it that he is taking medicines properly. And they have been really kind enough to monitor that the drug taking is absolutely perfect. I'm talking about a mental illness. And this is also part of our uh, kind of extended uh, therapeutic procedure. Can you identify yourself? Yeah, uh, I'm Harish Mary, I'm a student professor here and also associate warden of us. Um, so as I think you already said, uh, so mental health is not necessarily understood, understood so well. I mean, for students itself, basically they are young and they, I think it started as a stress, which basically when it goes to a level where it's a breakdown or something, that could lead to something like depression or whatever, you basically can not that. My question is, could something like in terms of early detection or a screening program you could have here, where basically, because eventually either it comes to a series of physical symptoms that coming, then you refer to a psychiatrist, or because they may not directly themselves identify themselves as mental patient, 
because they see like every day assignment to be a stress or like basically say social you know interaction all those things. So could we, I mean, are you thinking of having a interaction or a screening program, let's say periodic level at IIT, so that we can basically identify these cases? We would have to do that. <laughs> Stress is only when you are challenged with the stress. I may challenge at a very high intensity level. Some may collapse at a very low intensity level. Now, when I do screening, it is at a sedate level, a neutral level. So, in neutral level, I may not able to tap those symptoms of psychopathology. And when a challenging situation is posed of various uh, intensity, in that case, I will be able to know that the situation is uh, not so good. If I am going to do general condition examination and relevant uh, body investigation, clinical, is it done? Ah, is it done? Yes. Now, then there are attitude tests, I will say which may be possibly done over here, whether the person, because I have seen many police people from higher rank to the uh, lower rank. The attitude was not there at all for the profession, but they have become. So there the attitude, they, they, they were screened for physical tests, you know, the look and the height and the attitude. The software was not so competent enough for the nothing. Uh, I just say that we have to. What we really have to do is uh, there is two ways we can do this. Is one is that, like you said, the screen procedure, which has its limitations, as very rightly pointed out by Dr. Kumar, and some potentials also that means we can detect inflammation, interest. Recently, we had a case who did the boy had said finally that I never wanted to be in IIT. Uh, we had a student had said that. That's what we really did. So uh, this is one thing which comes very strongly. But what we really uh, we think and I think we would agree with this, that sensitization to issues is very important. Because what happens is, uh, some of the students walk in and say that I feel very anxious because of the exam. But two things happen to me, either I hide it because I will be seen as a very weak person or I am bullied. So these two things are very common at students level. They are bullied very badly. That if you are, if you feel very anxious, a boy will be said you are effeminate. When you are very sissy, how can you be frightened? How can you be afraid? How can you have fear? Look, I don't have fear. So some bullying occurs essentially because the person has symptoms which show so-called weakness. We don't, we don't. There is nothing like weak and strong in in psychiatry in mental health. So, uh, so sensitizing people uh, to uh, listen and be more empathic to people who express. Uh, fear and anxiety, particularly inability to cope with stress is something which is which is true. And not only at undergraduate level, believe me, I, uh, frankly speaking, I see equal number of postgraduate students. In fact, I uh, attack more postgraduate students than undergraduate students who come with problems because of the aptitude. You know what Dr. Kumar said in terms of aptitude and in terms of also not being able to cope with the kind of, you know, the kind of, kind of, uh, Ambiance and the culture which is there in IIT, which is which is going to be there, but it's a premier issue. So they can't cope with that, and that's that's a very very sensitive segment that I see in IIT today of postgraduate students who require uh, and the students who have early breakdown, essentially. Sadly, uh, a disorder called schizophrenia. The onset is very early in adolescence, 17, 18. That's the time in the first episode of schizophrenia may occur, and that's a very very difficult. Uh, each to have a uh, schizophrenic breakdown. And general population is 1% population, so we have uh, life seizures. You know. so, I tell you about the pilot study they did in IIT Gandhi Nagar three years back. They had very few students and uh, few faculty members. So they uh, annually they would have a health checkup, and in which they would give a questionnaire. Uh, where they would uh, have questions such as uh, how many times did you cry or how many times did you feel very stressed, how many times you thought you should leave the hostel and go, uh, such uh, quite a few questions. Uh, so the faculty advisor would uh, you know get information about these questions from students. So then they identified some three students, like they hardly had 120 students or so. 
uh, and uh, two of them they thought they offered that you can take a subject less okay for the next semester the student refused he said that why should i i want to do all the subjects you know so uh, mental health is not something that uh, uh, you know we can understand from other you know, we are just talking about what happens when we detect psychopathology. My suggestion will be, just extending what you suggested, why not start some kind of, uh, you know, initially some stress management workshop for them, uh, teach them what are the mental hygiene good practices, you know, what kind of uh, good lifestyle they should practice, even in the premises as a part of, uh, provide them a platform for that, you know, they have time, they, they don't have a lot of commuting time wastage. So, kind of a meditation, kind of a hall for them. Those who wish to do, they will definitely join such activities. Apart from recreational things, this good mental and hygiene practices also be available, which is not a cost effective. I mean, they are cost effective. So, I think that, that should be done rather than waiting for psychopathology to arise and then start running after it. Please. Why is there at the back? About restraining the uh, students, etc., don't you want to know? Especially the hall managers. I, think, uh, I would ask this uh, current trends and fashion which affects a large group of students. For instance, in hostels there are certain wings which would have about 10 to 15 students who tend to develop a kind of you know, substance abuse or alcoholism. So it becomes a trend and it becomes some kind of fashion which is being talked about. So is there any community kind of remedies or intervention that uh, can be helpful? Well, see, this whole program has to start at a level from the entrance of the campus itself. The availability of these drugs, accessibility to these drugs, you know, then uh, the peer group that is indulging to this drug, uh, drugs or misuse, they, are they given any kind of uh, treatment program? I have with the local police authorities and uh, see that any hubs are around where they get all, all this stuff, which is possible, you know. So it's a it's a huge activity. It's not a solo I uh, hospital activity. It's not a solo administration activity. It has to be tied up with the social welfare and the local police authorities. Then only it can work effectively. Otherwise, you know, it's very difficult to talk of all these things. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because there are a lot of pitfalls where they can, you know, there are peer, peer culture is, is very, very important. You know, what starts as a status becomes, if you don't, that means it's a stigma. It goes that way. And if you don't indulge into it, you are stigmatized that you are not smart enough. So we, we really feel that this is a major issue. Most of the students who have come, they have not met me in the campus. They have met me outside in my private setup. So it will be true for all three of us. We have seen IIT students coming privately, meeting us in our clinics and saying that this has become very rampant, this is a major issue. And 70% of the time is spent, that, the, the, that time I, we spend together, 70% of the time is spent on rationalizing how cannabis is a very harmless substance. So, it's a big culture about this is organic, this is harmless, everybody does this, this is for creativity, this is just a recreational and this is what everyone has done. Uh, it doesn't cause dependence, there is no actual harm. So, all, yeah, all this is, all this is, you know, kind of brain, they are brainwashed to believe this. And we at the other end, we have seen such terrible calamities of people you know, taking uh, cannabis and, you know, uh, creating a lot of problems for themselves as well as the whole family. Now, one, one person consuming cannabis is, a, is not an individual's problem. It speaks of the health of the family, it speaks of the health of this peer group, health of the community and health of the institute also. So, we believe this peer culture is very strongly influencing and sensitizing students at very early age because most of them take why? Why they do it? Because they, they can't, they want to conform to group norm and the group norm is taking. So how group norms can differ? You know, group norms are not really take consumption of cannabis. It can be so many other ways. So that this culture of looking at cannabis uh, as, 
as a not harmless substance is what is really required right now. Yeah. And other thing like uh, Dr. Kumar said that there's a stricter uh, uh, enforcement is of course we would say but this nothing not within our limitation to, not within us to say that. So uh, just a follow up on that question and uh, this question is uh, to the IIT hospital yeah. uh, Dr. Shah for instance. Is there a statistics available as to how many such cases are reported to the hospital on an annual basis? Is there a hospital centric data available which can be uh, intervened more effectively? Yeah, we have data in every case of uh, substance abuse that we come across. We report to the uh, dean unless it comes from the dean. So it's there with the dean's office as well. But uh, what comes to us is a very small portion of what is actually happening and uh, the worst cases unfortunately we are not able to report because they are so inebriated that we don't know whether there is a there is psychosis or there is drug substance abuse. So you know uh, I would say in two months one such case goes without report. Yes. Mix, mix. So we report alcohol because we can check alcohol only, but there is another substance use. So our data is not accurate, but definitely we have data and we can, uh, uh, th there is no doubt in anybody's mind that it is uh, increasing, the substance abuse is increasing exponentially. We really feel very bad about students who have to go through what they go through after using substances. Second issue that come, I think we, we must address the students, representatives, those who are inside here, is that students who come with a problem, mental health, any, any illness, physical illness, okay, mental health illness or any severe anxiety, the first thing, thing that as, as, as uh, hospital authorities, Dr. Shah, myself, Dr. Uh, Radhika, we believe that the family should be informed, family must be in the loop, because family must know what is going wrong with their own child. If, if anxiety becomes very severe and the child is, the, the student is very unwell, then the, the parents will come and first thing that they will say is why we were not informed. And the first thing that the students say is don't inform. So that's a, that's a, and because my parents will be under stress, you know, my father has a heart attack, everyone can they have heart attack, high blood pressure, diabetes. Okay, we are down that why did you end up doing all this, you know, that, that's a question we don't ask, but we have in mind that if that was the case, why did you get into uh, alcohol or something? So I think this, as, as since you are very close to students, in telling students that once such a thing happens, it is best that parents are informed, parents are in the loop. They are the ones who provide accurate data and that we call objective data. The student is unaware what he is doing. So when, whenever we say we would like to see a warden, assistant warden or a student, it's not to, not, to, not to have gossip, not to chat with them, but just to get as much information as possible is going to help. And I see when students walk in with their friends, their recovery is much better, much better because they have that sense of Bonding. bonding with students and they give fascinating support. I have seen you know, students sitting with their own friends and caring so much. So I think that is very important, that is a very nice thing to see. But uh, the, the patient is unaware of this. But on, as normal people, it is our responsibility to lend hands because they are not aware that they actually need help. This is, this is what their state of mind. Yeah. So just something uh, maybe from the hospital. Um, so um, whether it is substance abuse or I know, like they are addicted to some of those. Um, so because as you said, like whether mood, thoughts, or behavior. Thing. So how now in terms of data? Like how lengthy period that basic students have gone through that we are able to detect it? Or like in terms of do we have any information on that? Like. Because do we think it's a one month, six months? Because it depends on like new students come, they have more stress, and then they they cope up with it like as they progress. So what is like how after what length basically it is basically reported to the hospital? Uh, when a person uh, is unable to tolerate the dose, he may just uh, go amok and 
or fall down or his knee comes with the first dose. Those who tolerate well come later. So uh, there is no such, uh, uh, we wouldn't know how long he has taken. Most of the time he comes to us, if he is uh, not, uh, if he does not have control, he will give us the correct history as to how long he has taken. If he has little really control over his mind, he will not give us history as how long he has taken. So we wouldn't know, but there are many, uh, many a cases who come after consuming only once. Because they just can't uh, cope with the symptoms that they experience. So they may have stopped consuming it. So cannabis, they may have stopped consuming, but they have bad trips. That means they have experienced something bad, they, so they stop. But the bad trips continue. And the bad trips could be contributing to anxiety and depression in their day to day. That's a very common thing that you see. Bad trips is what students come in. And, and it is not reported because bad trip is my personal failure. So it's not even shared with the peer. Because everyone says good, good, good. So they can't openly express also that they didn't, they didn't have that kind of experience. So bad trips is something which students have. But panic anxiety can be precipitated with one, one single puff can precipitate panic anxiety. And we have seen it. Yeah. So, as a I have like uh, sent many students to counseling, counselor, and all these things. And I, what I noticed that, I, that uh, after one or two sessions, they stop going. Actually, so sometimes the counselor referred to the psychiatrist at the hospital, and then there is no way the counselor sent. So counselor, counselors are used to send the summers to catch the students and all, but they don't respond. Actually. So as a barman, when we try to call, then he says that he stopped. I stopped going there. I asked why, then he has no answer. So this is happening actually. So we are doing something and then getting interrupted. So is there any way to, like, I don't know. We have been thinking about it, but I don't know what to do. See, the issues are common in the mental health practices, whether with mental illness or with drug abuse. Compliance is a challenge we are facing. And uh, finally, it's a persuasion that matters. Uh, as I said, uh, someone reported also that bringing the uh, use of the patient in picture is also essential. Where sometimes, sometimes this atmosphere is not conducive for him to remain away from the drug. In that case, the religious has been uh, uh, needs to be asked also to take him uh, for a week or two or whatever it is to remain dry, totally cut off from this because as uh, such tricks also occur but sometimes those cue, uh, cues in the environment also gives him the craving because that craving is the main part and this craving can start on seeing the friend circle with whom he had and the timings in the daytime when he used to have the events when he used to have this particular thing so those memories are so strong enough to give him withdrawals. So this milieu change for some time will definitely help him rather than just if he is adamant for counseling because he feels stigmatized possibly and that's why he is trying to run away from it. That could be, uh, that is my expression of it. Uh, yeah. That is your expression. Problem is, uh, is a common phenomenon. Uh, it's a curse issues. Basically, acceptance is very reluctant. Acceptance is there, you know, because uh, I walk in and say the, the, the person will say that I have been asked to see you, means I am not willing to see you. So the, the problem is it starts there because it's forced to the criminal paper, not seen. Then, uh, but that that's the reason. So the stigma is one of the very important thing that you know hampers uh, follow up uh, regularly. And they also have this feeling that uh, either, either it's a quick fix that you meet a counsellor once and all, everything is going to be, you know, very nice rosy picture. Or they have, it's like they have seen American film where people have put on the couch and this goes on for years. So they walk in and say, where is your couch? So, so they think it's going to be a very long term thing for which they are not willing or it's a big, big fix. It is neither. It's a big 
basically an interactive process which takes them through the process. So expectations and all these things are very important that needs to be addressed. And that's why the peer would come very handy because they say, Hota hai, hota hai, no, leke chal. I'll come with you, you know, accompanying, spending time and explaining uh, to the family members becomes very important because we believe that you are we are captains, you are vice captains. The remaining who's non-patient family members, friends, they are vice captains. Yeah? They can take place of a captain anytime. So compliance can be that means better follow up, compliance with medication is very important. There is a lot of resistance in terms of like I like I answered the medication is that can give rest to suicide, is Sony ki dawa hai and all that. So that's not true uh, and Google is most of the times their master. So all that Google says is not true. Uh, Thank you. 